So good morning, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for coming here today. My name is Mike Medoff. I work at School Choice Wisconsin, and I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day for joining us. I'll grab that window and pull it up. It should be the bottom. Um, if everybody could please turn their mics off and their cameras off during the presentation. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat bar, and I and Carol, who's assisting me, will get those two, our two presenters during their Q&A session at the end of their presentation. So thank you all for that. It's my privilege to introduce right now, we have Jason Bedrick, the Director of Policy at EdChoice and the author of the article, Who's Afraid of School Choice? And Mike McShane, who is the Director of National Research at EdChoice and the author of The Accountability Myth. So as the introductions are there, Jason, if you want to start off. Sure, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to School Choice Wisconsin. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, so there you go. Uh, the question that uh, I address in my report uh, uh, concerns the what is really the most common argument uh, against school choice which is that school choice will destroy public education. This is something that uh, I don't know if you hear it as much in Wisconsin, given that you've had school choice for so long, but this is certainly something that as we go around the country and try to pass new school choice bills, the opponents always lead with this argument. Uh, and so the question is, uh, is this, are these uh, opponents of school choice who are predicting doom and gloom, uh, Cassandra's who are, uh, accurately predicting the destruction of public education, uh, or are they chicken littles that should not be believed? Uh, now, I think 30 years ago, this was really an open question. Uh, the, the story that the other side tells is, is frankly a plausible story. Uh, the idea is if you give every family a choice, uh, the families that are most interested in education are going to be the ones who are the most likely to exercise that choice. Uh, which means that on net, the, the children who remain behind are the ones whose parents are, let's say, less likely to help with their homework, less likely to read with them at night. Uh, therefore, they are the ones who on net are more likely to be the hardest to teach. Uh, and the public schools will have uh, less uh, funding uh, to actually teach them. Uh, that's going to lead to a deterioration in quality. Uh, that's going to cause even more families to leave. Again, the families that are of the remainder, the ones that are more interested in education. So then you have even harder to teach students, even less money to teach them. And you see how this creates a death spiral that destroys the public school system. Uh, but like I said, 30 years ago, maybe this was a legitimate question, but now we've got three decades of experience with states that have uh, educational choice options. Uh, so uh, my report looks at the five states that have the most robust uh, and longest uh, uh, lasting school choice programs. So that would be Arizona, Florida, your home state of Wisconsin, Indiana and in Ohio. Uh, and you notice that these are not in alphabetical order, they are in order of what we call the ed choice share. So that is the percentage of students in the state who are participating in a private school choice program. So here we're talking about vouchers, like in Wisconsin, uh, tax credit scholarships, and K-12 education savings accounts. Uh, those are sort of like the new kid on the block. Some people call them vouchers on steroids, that like that's a bad thing. Uh, but the uh, the education savings accounts, uh, sort of like the voucher, are usually publicly funded uh, with a portion of the state funds that uh, the state would have spent on a child at public school. But whereas a voucher can be used for private school tuition, the ESA can be used um, in addition or instead of tuition uh, for things like tutoring, textbooks, homeschool curriculum, online learning, um, educational therapy, uh, and, and a wide variety of other things. And, and un used funds can be rolled over from year to year to save for future expenses. Uh, so we're talking about those three types of programs. We're not talking about charter schools or inter-district choice or magnet schools. Uh, and you can see that each of these states have had school choice for at least a decade, uh, some going back uh, more than 25 years. 
uh, and all of them have at least 3.5% of students statewide, up to Arizona, which has just under 7%. Um, but you see, look, in, in Wisconsin, you know, um, more than a quarter of students in Milwaukee are participating in the voucher program. Uh, in Ohio and Cleveland, you've got, you know, more than 10% of kids. So there's some really robust options. So has that led to the destruction of education, of, of the public school system in these states? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, if you look uh, across the NAEP scores, uh, so it's fourth and eighth grade math and reading, uh, the NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So this is the this is known as the nation's report card. Uh, over the last two decades, you see that with the one exception of Wisconsin's fourth grade reading score, which went down slightly, although really, I mean, one one point is, is statistically neg negligible. Uh, all of these uh, the states have done have out have um, improved their performance on all these measures, including the AP, over the last two decades. All the highlighted ones uh, are where they've actually outpaced the national average gains, uh, and we see that especially this, this, the two states that have the most robust options, Arizona and Florida, are the ones that are the most likely to be outpacing those gains. So I think we can confidently say that just based on the raw test score data, you can reject the claim of opponents that school choice is going to destroy the public school system. However, this does not prove that school choice is leading to these gains, right? It could be the case that states are doing lots of different things. Maybe they increased funding maybe they uh, had some new accountability regulations. And it's possible that these other policy interventions are producing strong positive effects. And school choice is still a ne negative. It's just that the negative effects of school choice are not so strong and they've been outweighed by the positive effects of these other changes. Uh, so uh, to test that theory, uh, there is something called the Education Freedom Index that some researchers at the University of Arkansas put together uh, in a recent report is more school choice associated with higher state level performance on the NAEP. Uh, and so their Education Freedom Index looks at things like the robustness of the school choice policies, not just uh, what we've been talking about, the private school choice policies, but also things like charter schools and interdistrict choice. Uh, they also look at uh, whether the private sector is, uh, you know, for both private schools and homeschooling, uh, you know, is it uh, more in the direction of freedom or is it more in the direction of government regulation? Uh, and what they find is that the more education freedom they have, uh, the stronger the association between uh, education freedom and academic scores and academic gains. So if they have more education freedom, you they tend to have higher test scores and that those test scores are increasing over time. Uh, we also have 28 studies that look in specific states, or in some cases, specific cities like Milwaukee, that look at the effects of the introduction of a voucher or tax credit scholarship program on the performance of public schools. 25 out of the 28 studies actually find a statistically significant positive effect. Uh, in other words, what they find is exactly the opposite of what the opponents claim. Uh, when you have a uh, school choice, the public system responds by improving their quality. We'll get into a few minutes uh, why that might be the case. Um, but one of the most recent studies by David Figlio at the you know, University of Northwestern and his team uh, they say, we find evidence that as public schools are more exposed to private school choice, their students experience increasing benefits as the program scales up. Now, this is from Florida's program, uh, which was is more than two decades old, and it's the largest in the country. There's more than 100,000 low and middle income students who are participating in the program. Uh, and again, what we see is that rather than as the program grows, it draws away the best students and the public school system collapses. No, actually quite the opposite. As the program grows over time, the public schools respond by improving their performance. Now, why is that? Well, one part of the story is that uh, what they find in, in Florida is actually, um, it's not that the best and brightest are leaving. Uh, the ones who are the most likely to leave 
are the ones who are performing lower on average on standardized tests than their demographic peers. Now, why might that be the case? Well, the students who are doing well, um, their parents tend to keep them in that system. It's the students who are struggling, who are not the right fit, uh, are, they're the ones that are, have the, the strongest incentive to leave. So even if the schools did nothing else, uh, you would see a positive effect on test scores because those students leave. Now, after those students uh, enter the scholarship program, after a few years, they're performing at the national average, which is to say that they are outperforming their demographic peers. So it ends up being better for everybody, the participating students and the non-participating students. But we're also seeing that those those non uh, those the, the public schools um, are actually also becoming more responsive because they no longer have a captive audience. And so they have to make better use of their resources. They have to be more responsive to the needs of parents and the needs of students. Um, and we Jason, see actually, we have, we have you got a question? question? Yes, yes, we have uh, somebody who asked about the previous uh, tables with the cities and he's asking, am I correct that the gains, Jason, correctly cites the table three are relative gains. Proficiency levels on absolute scale are still too low, right? Let's say that last part again. Proficiency levels on an absolute scale are still too low. Yeah, I would say that is the case. So what we're looking at here is gains relative to where they were. It could still be the case that they are, uh, you know, low a lot lower than we would like them to be but they are higher than they were before the introduction of the school choice program uh, that's what we're talking about here and i should have noted too when they talk about competition here how are they measuring that well they're looking at things like uh for a given um public school how far away is the closest uh private option uh within a five or ten mile radius how many private options are there uh, of those private options, uh, are they all the same? Is it three Catholic schools or is there a mix? Is it a Catholic school, a Montessori school, a classical education school, right? And what they find is that um, across these various measures of competition, the more competition you have, the stronger the positive effects on the public school. Uh, and as I was saying, the, the, the positive effects are not just higher standardized test scores, uh, but it's also things like lower rates of suspensions and absences. Uh, so I think we can strongly reject the claims of uh, the chicken littles. Now you might say, okay, well, look, uh, there's a mountain of evidence here that uh, the, the school choice opponents are simply wrong um, uh, about the you know, potentially devastating effects on the public school system. So probably we're not hearing these claims anymore, right? Well, no, we're hearing them all the time. Uh, and uh, sometimes legislators will say, you know, I, I'd love to have a universal school choice program. I, I wish every kid in the state had access to, to uh, a school voucher or an education savings account. But if I go too fast, if I go too big and too bold, the other side is going to start screaming. And, and so, you know, what I'm going to do is gonna, we're going to start small. We're just going to start with a few kids, you know, maybe left-handed kids or redheads or both. Uh, and uh, the question becomes, will school choice opponents actually modify their rhetoric based on the size and scope of the school choice proposal? Uh, so what we did is we looked at the five states that passed new programs last year, West Virginia, New Hampshire, Kentucky, Missouri, and Arkansas. And you'll see that the, the, the bottom three states, about 50, 40 to 50% of students were eligible, but with the funding mechanism, fewer than 1% of students could actually participate. Uh, New Hampshire and West Virginia both passed uh, publicly funded K-12 education savings accounts. Uh, New Hampshire, about a third of students are eligible, but every eligible child, uh, if they applied, would receive an education savings account. And in West Virginia, where they call them HOPE scholarships, uh, more than nine out of 10 students were eligible. Every child who is either switching out of a public school or is entering kindergarten is eligible. Uh, so you might expect that in a state like West Virginia, you know, almost every child is eligible. Well, they're going to be screaming bloody murder. This is going to destroy the public school system. Uh, maybe slightly less so in New Hampshire. And then in Kentucky, Missouri, and Arkansas, you might expect, well, there's going to, they're going to be a lot more moderate in their rhetoric. They're going to be a lot more, um, you know, restrained. So is that the case? So who said this? I believe this bill would be the beginning of the end to public education, right? Would that be somebody in West Virginia? 
Nope, that was Kentucky Governor Andrew Bashir. And as you recall, uh, only about a half of 1% of students in the state could actually participate, but he sees this as the beginning of the end, right? Uh, so we came up with a you know one to 10 scale, basically going from mild to catastrophic. Uh, and we were looking at the rhetorical intensity of opponents of, of school choice, whether they were legislators, um, uh, public school groups, other special interest groups, uh, um, columnists, you know, so we were looking at uh, testimony that was delivered uh, at the state legislature or arguments that were on the floor of the legislature, op-eds and editorials, uh, public statements, press releases, those sorts of things. Uh, and in the spirit of Spinal Tap, uh, we noticed that uh, a number of opponents turned the rhetoric all the way up to 11. So we added an 11th category for apocalyptic rhetoric, uh, you know, talking about the destruction of public education. But if you look uh, across these different states, uh, you'll notice the average is an eight, which was uh, severe, strongly worded concerns. Uh, but uh, there is no clear pattern that distinguishes the states that had these small uh, school choice proposals versus those that had the, the more robust ones. So if you look at West Virginia, again, more than nine out of 10 kids are eligible, but they were exactly at that average of uh, an eight on the rhetorical intensity scale. Uh, however, uh, you look at, uh, you know, Kentucky, Missouri, and Arkansas, they're right around eight as well. And the state that actually had the most uh, the, the, um, intense rhetoric was Arkansas, where fewer than one-tenth of 1% 1 of students were actually able to participate in the program. Uh, also, in every single state, there were some people who cranked up the rhetoric all the way to 11. So for example, in Arkansas, you had a state rep uh, talking about uh, this bill being the final nail in the coffin of public education. Uh, in Kentucky, they said public education has its neck inside a guillotine ready to have his head cut off. Uh, and that was a state senator. Uh, in uh, Missouri, the Kansas City Star editorialized that this was uh, the dismantling of public school districts. Uh, so you're not going to, if you, if you moderate the size of your bill, uh, you are not actually going to induce opponents of school choice to moderate the, uh, the, the intensity of the rhetoric. What you are going to do is turn off potential supporters. Uh, this is from Ed Choice's uh, annual Schooling in America survey. This is a very consistent finding that we have had uh, over the last decade or so. When you ask, uh, if you ask respondents uh, if ESAs should be available to all families, about three quarters say yes. But if you ask if it should be only based on financial need, it's a 50-50 proposition. Uh, so what you're doing by decreasing the size of your bill is decreasing the level of support for your bill without actually inducing the opponents to moderate their rhetoric. Uh, so no matter what, the opponents of school choice are gonna squawk, but they are chicken littles and can be ignored. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Mike McShane. Thanks so much, Jason. I'm just gonna... Fire up my PowerPoint here, and I'm just going to keep the good times rolling, uh, doing some myth busting. So, Jason was, uh, you know, busting the myths of school choice chicken littles and their dire predictions about uh, what happens when when school choice takes hold uh, that don't actually come true. I want to take a slightly different tack and and try busting. Uh, a slightly different myth. Now, stop me if you've heard this one before. And I imagine folks that are on this call have heard this at least once or twice. School choice is bad because public schools are accountable and private schools are not. If you've spent only a moment inside of a hearing about a school, a prospective school choice bill, or as, as Jason did, you've perused op-ed pages or others. This is something that you hear all the time when a new state is thinking about instituting some kind of school choice program. Now, when someone, usually an opponent of school choice, makes this argument, what happens? Well, we hear from the usual suspects. And I should be very clear, 
you know, I count myself as one of these folks. Jason is probably one of these folks. Many of the people on this call, folks, at the good folks at School Choice Wisconsin, we're the kind of usual suspects when we hear this argument. And what's the most common argument that we make when we hear this? We say, no, that's wrong. Private schools, you say private schools aren't accountable? That's crazy. Private schools are incredibly accountable. Parents have their own money, that their, their skin in the game there, they're paying the cost, they're going to care much more than some distant bureaucrat might. Um, when it comes to things like a voucher or tax credit, they have the choice to go to different places. Um, so they're, you know, private schools are incredibly accountable. How could you possibly say that? And I want to be clear. I 100% agree with that statement. And nothing that I'm going to say throughout the course of this presentation is in any way to try and uh, dissuade you from believing that. What I actually wanted to do, though, was tackle the first part of that statement, because while we spend a lot of our times talking about just how accountable private schools are, I don't know if we do enough uh, spend enough time talking about how unaccountable public schools are. We kind of let folks gloss over that and sort of base on this assumption that private that public schools are accountable. And I'm going to let you know, I don't think that they are. So the paper that I wrote looks at this idea of public school accountability, and is it true that public schools are held accountable? Now, when we talk about accountability, we tend to think of it in three different sort of avenues. Financial accountability, and that's that public schools have to answer for how much money they spend and, and the money that they spend educating kids. Democratic accountability, that uh, public schools have to answer to voters and academic accountability, and that's that schools have to answer for the academic program that they put on, that they have to answer for the performance of the children in their care. Now, I go into much greater depth in the paper, so I'm just giving you the kind of movie trailer version of this, but the argument that I have in the paper is that traditional public schools are not really accountable. They're not financially accountable, they're not democratically accountable, and they're not academically accountable. And I'm gonna very briefly now just walk through each of these three arguments. So the first, when it comes to financial accountability, we at EdChoice poll a nationally representative sample of Americans every month and a nationally representative sample of teachers every quarter. We do that. We've done this for a couple of years now in partnership with Morning Consult, a big polling firm. And if we want to talk about school spending and we want to talk about holding schools accountable, in order for whether that's voters, parents, frankly, teachers, anyone who's involved in the system to be able to hold schools accountable, they need some basic information, right? They need to know how much money is being spent, how it is being spent, and then they can have a discussion of whether that's right or wrong. The problem is, is that our school funding systems are so completely opaque, people don't know how money is being spent or how much money is being spent. And I can show you exactly what that looks like. In our polls, we ask, again, a nationally representative sample of Americans, we actually oversample parents. We get a nationally representative sample of parents. We ask them a very simple question. How much money do you think your local schools spend per kid per year? Do you know what they say? The median response amongst American adults is that they think that schools spend about $5,000 per kid per year. Interestingly, school parents think that it's less. They think that it's about $4,000 per kid per year. If you look at the upper right hand corner of this slide, you can see we have the 2018 numbers. The numbers have gone up and it kind of depends on what you count or what you don't. A good national representative sample now is probably, you know, this time it was about 13. Now it's probably up to around $14,000, maybe a little bit more per kid per year. So people don't know. People think that it's like a third, of, in some cases, almost a quarter of um, what we actually spend. So if you don't know how much money is being spent, you can't hold people accountable for how they're spending it. Now, as I mentioned, um, we also pull teachers. And do you all think that teachers um, are better at estimating this or worse? Do you think they're closer to the truth or farther away? Well, it's actually kind of a trick question because teachers actually answer the same thing. That the average teacher, the median answer from teachers is the same as the median uh, answer for all Americans. So they think that it's about $5,000 per student per year. So 
my argument here, and again, there's more in the paper about bond elections and all these sorts of ways that we ask people to talk about funding, is that people are kept in the dark about how much money is being spent and how it is being spent, and therefore they are thwarted from being able to hold people accountable. Now, I do want to put in a quick Ed Choice plug. My colleague, Marty Lucan, um, working with other people, but Marty really spearheaded it, created this project called Project Nickel. And if you actually, you can go to the URL uh, at the top of the slide there, and you can actually, he did all this work to scrape spending data because this data is available. You just really have to look for it, which causes us to ask some questions of why is it so darn difficult to figure this stuff out. He actually created this page where you can search school by school. And I think if you put this in, you'll be fascinated to see how schools that are even in the same district that could be actually quite close to one another geographically often spend vastly different amounts of money per kid per year. And hopefully his efforts and those of others might actually start having more conversations about financial accountability, but they are just a start. So that's financial accountability. Completely opaque system, makes it impossible to hold people accountable because they don't know basic information about what's even happening. The next question might be uh, if, uh, if uh, financial is the most, this democratic accountability idea is one of the most popular ones that kind of opponents for school choice like to talk about. They say, no, look, local public schools have to answer to a school board. They answer to the body politics, the Vox Populi, whatever sort of platitude that you want to use. And whether it's a private school or a charter school or anything outside of that, they don't answer to those. Um, so let's talk for a minute about school board elections. Um, uh, interestingly, you know, there's been a lot of work kind of in the world of political science talking about school board elections. This is a great book that was done about it, Timing and Turnout, How Off-Cycle Elections Favor Organized Groups. And the sort of title gives away what's happening. But about 75% of school board elections in America are held off-cycle. That is that they are not held at the same time as or other elections. And most of us know that you know early November, every other year, there's going to be major elections, representatives, senators, every four years, presidents, uh, senators, Congress people, et cetera. Also lots of bond elections and others. We have lots of media coverage, lots of discussion. Everything's kind of focused on this big election. People educate themselves and they go and vote. Again, for three quarters of school districts across the country, that is not when their elections take place. Instead, they take place sometimes in off years, sometimes in off years and off months. It's like a random Tuesday in April. And as a result, we've seen, and again, there's not really a lot of debate about the effect of this. It dramatically drives down turnout. Way fewer people participate in school board elections than in other even municipal elections that take place. What happens when you have low turnout elections, as the name of the sort of subtitle of this book gives away, organized interest groups are able to have an outsized role in sort of um, getting the, the, the outcomes that they want. You have to organize fewer people. It's less expensive. Your block of people has much more sway in those things. So organized interest groups are able to actually um, have a much bigger say than their actual sort of democratic representation in the community. Now, there have been efforts, and I, I don't, I'm not sure what the state of play is in Wisconsin right now, um, but there have been efforts around the country to actually move school board elections on cycle. Interestingly, in my home state of Missouri, I'm from Kansas City, um, uh, earlier this year, just so that you see from my, my tweet from earlier this year, the, the Missouri legislature was trying to move school board elections on cycle. And interestingly, it was opposed by the school boards association. What? How's that possible? Why would a, a, an organization that represents school boards want to have lower turnout elections? You would think that if you represent school boards, you want as many people as possible voting in them, involved, knowing what they're talking about. Um, kind of makes you wonder why they want this to happen. I would kind of go back to <laughs> what we see on the other side of the slide, low turnout elections favor organized interest groups, organized interest groups like school boards, associations, teachers unions, and the other kind of alphabet soup of advocacy organizations that are out there. So I don't think traditional public schools are held financially accountable. I don't think they're really held democratically accountable because of the way these elections work. And that comes to the last area, which is 
academic accountability. And again, when lots of people talk about accountability, they talk about no child left behind. They talk about standardized testing. They talk about all of these systems that uh, states have come up with to rate schools and, and gather data and uh, accredit or not accredit schools, et cetera. Um, when the rubber actually meets the road, and frankly, I you know was working on this paper kind of during the, the pandemic, but um, even before when the pandemic has, has paused in standardized testing and paused in all of these things, even before the pandemic. So this, it's, it's sort of even more true today uh, than when this paper came out. But even before the pandemic was happening, we were seeing school accountability systems that while they collect a lot of data, while they administer a lot of tests, they don't actually do a lot when it comes to holding people accountable. And I'll use my home state of Missouri uh, as an example. So Missouri has 517 school districts. And this year of those 517 school districts, when it comes to the state collecting their data, administering their tests, given all that, 512 of those school districts were fully accredited. That's the sort of highest bar that the state can give you. Only five were even provisionally accredited, which is kind of like kind of being on probation. The penalties aren't particularly stiff for that. Zero school districts in Missouri failed to meet their standard. And in, in what I would argue sort of were held accountable, right? They were had to answer for their decisions that, that they made. Overwhelmingly, every school district, you know, to a first approximation, every school district in the state was found to meet all the bars that they needed to meet. Well, I don't know if you have family in Missouri. Um, maybe you want to call them up and say, congratulations. I didn't realize your schools were so awesome. So I decided to pull some uh, data on how Missouri schools were performing, expecting to see, you know, if all of these schools are get, hitting their accreditation bars, obviously kids must all uh, be knocking it out of the park. I pulled stuff from the NAEP, the National Assessment for Educational Progress, which is what Jason was talking about. And because I was talking about my home state, I actually tried to set the bar as low as I could. So what I actually did was look at how many kids score basic on the NAEP. So the four performance categories are below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced. I didn't look at advanced. I didn't even look at proficient. I just looked at like the lowest sort of basic level that you can get to. And what did I find? Well, in fourth grade, between a fifth and a third, depending if you're looking at math or reading, um, between a fifth or a third of students did not even hit basic, right? They scored below basic in mathematics and reading. And if you look in eighth grade, you no know, 30, 25% score did not hit basic. So this is like a quarter of students, um, anywhere from a third to a fifth, sort of settling right around that quarter range, did not even hit basic. And yet every school district uh, is at least hitting the minimal levels of accreditation. Something is not matching up there. These school districts are not actually being held accountable. And I imagine that if you look in Wisconsin or you look at other states across the country, things are very similar. Now, again, that's not to say that there aren't big accountability programs. And as I said, tests and data that are collected, but you actually have to ask the question, how many schools are actually held accountable for this, that they actually suffer some sort of consequences uh, when, when you see numbers like these? And at least the answer in Missouri is basically no one. So I wanna close with just one kind of image because I think some people have heard this presentation, Jason and I have been doing this roadshow kind of across the country talking about this. And I think there's sort of two paths that you can take out of this. One is to say, well, look, we need to double down on this existing system. We need to have more financial transparency. We need to move school board elections on cycle. And we need to put teeth back into accountability systems or teeth into accountability systems. And, and most of that stuff, I'm not going to argue with you about. I think it's a good idea to move school board elections on cycle. I think more transparency uh, is possible. If you're going to have uh, accountability systems, they should probably try and hold people accountable. But to be honest with you, you know, for the last 30 and in some places more than 30 years, that's what we've been trying to do. School kind of reformers have been trying to make some of these basic changes and we haven't been able to do it after billions of dollars and lots of effort and elections and all of those things. And it just makes me skeptical the degree to which when you have a system that's incentives are not a, a sort of aligned to being held accountable, how often do you want to keep banging your head into the wall trying to do this? The other path is that of school choice, right? in saying we want to give parents options outside of this existing system and we want to 
put them in the driver's seat of holding schools accountable. We want them to collect the information based on their observations, conversations with people, give them the information that they need, and then have them be the ones that actually hold schools accountable by choosing to send their children there or not, and by getting involved in those schools once their children are there. Um, but that's just my sort of tying it together and looking towards uh, the future, but I'll go ahead and stop there and Jason and I can take questions. So if anybody wants to ask Jason or Mike a question, just unmute your mic and you can ask the question directly to them. Can you hear me, can Mike? Can you hear me, Mike? We can. Uh, Jason and Mike, uh, this is George Mitchell. Really fantastic stuff. We are, um, I'm, I'm kind of encouraged I, as I look at the names of all the participants on this uh, chat. I don't, I know one or two of them. So I'm glad the word is, is being spread far and wide. Wisconsin today, the, the, <clears throat> the legislature probably will send the governor a universal choice bill, uh, he'll veto it, but that will become a, a defining issue this year. There's a separate um, development going on in Wisconsin, and that is a proposal to, from the top down, rather than having parents break up the Milwaukee school system, there's a proposal that would, would have bureaucrats basically do it. Uh, it would be great if, um, if we were able to share with you guys uh, what's going on on that score because there needs to be some real pushback on the, um, the, the problems with that. And it, it's, it's a proposal that diverts attention and, and really activates the political base in Milwaukee. Um, I, I'd like to send you guys information about that and just you know see if we can engage you. But thank you again for, for this great job today. Thanks, George. Always great to hear from you and uh, happy yeah, to look over every to, sense. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear, see what's going on. I've been following it so much, a bit sort of in, in the background, seeing uh, the machinations there in, uh, in Milwaukee, but please send that along. What, one thing that I would add, uh, Jason's data before uh, referred only to the market share of vouchers. If you include uh, open enrollment to other school districts and charters, uh, the Milwaukee market share of those three of vouchers, charters, and open enrollment is now 47% of Milwaukee parents. Uh, we've almost, I mean, basically the parents are already breaking the system up and that's the way we should go and just let, let happy parents stay with the system. Uh, so th there's a lot going on here and this is going to be a year when the intellectual ammunition that you guys have is going to be quite important to us. So uh, good work. Other questions? Mike's uh, school choice is so old hat in Wisconsin since uh, this is where it started. You know, everyone's. Yeah. Okay, well, if no one else has any questions, I'm going to like to thank Ed Choice, Mike, and Jason for being on here, taking your time, and sharing all that great information with us. And I also would like to thank everybody for being on this call and taking part in this unique experience. So I'm going to end the recording now. And if anybody wants to stay on and ask any more questions. And I'll note that I put in the chat box, uh, the links to some blog posts that give like a short summary of each report. And then those both link to the reports themselves. Uh, there is also like a three minute video based on my report that actually has uh, some uh, video of, of legislators making these sorts of claims before we rebut them. So you might want to share that on social media. But thanks again. We really appreciate the time. And uh, if you do have questions later, uh, we're easy enough to reach uh, at EdChoice. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat. It's just jason at edchoice.org. And I think, Michael, it's your, yours is McShane at edchoice.org, right? Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Can I add a quick comment, Mike? 
Sure. Uh, the, uh, my experience, this is George again, my experience over many, many years is that uh, legislators, the, the glaze over, eyes glaze over factor is uh, strong. What I found uh, effective about this today was you guys were concise and you were focused on arguments that legislators hear and, and, and it, the animated part, the fact that you were alive, it's not just on a piece of paper is really good. And I, we need to figure out, we can certainly use today's uh, recording uh, with, with our allies, but the, uh, my own view is that the effectiveness of the information is, is greatly strengthened by the manner in which it was presented. If you hand a legislator even a three or four page executive summary, uh, it, it doesn't have the same pop. You, you've, got to, you've got to be able to kind of have a hook that gets their attention. And, and so what I really liked listening today was if, if our legislative allies could hear you, it's not so much our opponents, they're never gonna change, but if our allies could hear you, they would be reinforced in the validity of what they're doing and they would be their confidence in taking it forward would be would be strengthened. So I know that Mike and Nick at School Choice Wisconsin will they'll 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 have this recording. It'll be something that can be available. But the medium is often as important as the as the message. Well, thank you so much, George. If you want to arrange something like that, we'd be happy to participate. Yeah, it was great, great talking with y'all today. Thank you all. Anybody else have any other questions? I think every question has been answered in the chat box. We will be posting this recording and so others can see it. So thank you very much again and have a good day. Take care. Take care.